Hi everyone, uh, this is Professor Ellis with week four of Specialized Communications for Technology Students, English 1133 OL96 in the fall of 2021. I hope everybody's doing well, uh, that you've been you're staying safe, uh, that you've gotten vaccinated, you're masking up when you should. Um, you gotta take care of yourself and others, okay? Um, but we're getting through this, and so I, I hope we all continue to be healthy and can make it through this semester safely uh, and be successful you know, with our grades and everything that we need to get done. So with this week's class, uh, we're going to be continuing with the job application portfolio. But before we go further, just want to give you another reminder uh, that if you ever have questions, because obviously this is an asynchronous class, you know, we're not meeting at the same time. So when you have questions, you need to reach out to me, and you can do that by emailing me at jellis at citytech.cuny.edu, or you can come to my office hours, which are each Wednesday uh, from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, the link to the Google Hangout is on the left-hand side of our Open Lab site or uh, at the very top of the syllabus. So either way, you'll find that link. Click that. Um, if you're not logged into like your Gmail account, uh, then you just need to do that and then you'll be able to access uh, the Google Hangout. Now, I understand not everybody can meet during those times on Wednesday. So if you need to meet with me about the class uh, or any questions relating to um, you know, what we're working on, then just send me an email and let me know what your availability is like for like the next seven days or so. Um, that way it helps me find a time that fits both of our schedules uh, and I can just let you know back, hey, let's meet at this time that you specified and I'll give you a link to um, the Google Hangout. And if for whatever reason you can't connect to Google Hangouts, uh, we can also meet over Zoom. Uh, we could have a phone call. You know, we'll find some way to work together uh, so that I can you know, help you as much as I can uh, with whatever questions you have about the class. Um, and I'll give you guys a reminder about this at the end of class as well. Uh, but just remember that in addition to you reaching out to me when you have questions, always watch the whole lectures before proceeding with anything that we're doing on a given week. Um, as I've mentioned before, it's absolutely imperative that you watch the lecture videos and watch them as an active listener. That you're not just z you know, zoned in to what I'm talking about. Uh, by giving me your undivided attention. But also, like we talked about earlier in the semester, you want to have your notebook out, maybe set up with the Cornell method. You got your block over on one side for your keywords. You got a larger block next to that where you give the details. And then at the bottom, you have that section set aside to write a summary of that page of notes um, so that you can easily index and go back through uh, your materials, but also you're re-exposing your mind to those things uh, and you're having to work with those ideas uh, and put them in your own words when you write those summaries. So a lot of learning and a lot of you know, building in memory and also uh, just some of the cognitive work that takes place when we're trying to learn something is built into that note-taking exercise. So make sure that you're doing that with each of these lectures and incorporate that kind of stuff in your other classes as well because I guarantee you that it'll improve like your retention as well as the, the way that you're working with the ideas that you're learning in any given class. And it's something you can carry away from uh, your education at City Tech as well and use it in the workplace. You know, I've told you before that you know, I don't go anywhere uh, without like my little notepad and a pen so that I can always jot things down, whether it be I'm listening to what someone's telling me or I have my own thoughts that I want to record so that I don't lose them uh, later on. So this is something that I don't think is just you know, contained within your class. This is something that you can use outside of our class as well. All right, so with all you know, that, that being said, we need to get into um, week four. We've got a lot of stuff that we need to cover uh, in this week's class. Um, so just as a quick review, um, last week uh, we were continuing project one, the job application portfolio. Um, we talked about specifically the two types of resumes that you're going to be creating for this um, first project in our class. Uh, we went over the skills-based resume 
as well as the experience-based resume. Remember the skills-based resume foregrounds. That means like puts at the top, like you know, in your face, um, the things that you know how to do. And you can categorize those things if you use the template that I provided you with and then you change what those different categories are. But you use those categories to, to help present what you know how to do within different um, modules essentially. That those are ways that helps whoever's reviewing your resume to better understand the, the core competencies that you have, the core skills that you are able to bring to that job. And then within each of those categories, you give more finer details uh, about the types of things that you know how to do. Um, so again, rely on those uh, examples and those templates that we went over in last week's lecture and that I gave you copies of. They're all linked on our Open Lab site. Uh, I made those for you to make use of. So you, you have the models to give you some ideas and to see how things are put together. But then I also gave you those blank templates that you can then populate with that personal job seeking database that you um, started the project with uh, you know, a couple or a few weeks ago now uh, because we had the break from the different holidays. So you have that job seeking database of materials that really with that in hand, you're able to what we call plug and chug. You just copy and paste that material into the right place, do some massaging of it. You maybe change some words, give you, you use some real strong active verbs uh, to, to, to really show off what it is you know how to do uh, in your, for the skills that you have in the skills-based resume. Um, and also you researched uh, job listings a few weeks ago, um, which is gonna come in handy for this week's class. We're gonna return to that. But also when you were doing that research, you, you were picking up some key words and terminology and patterns that you different jobs that you might be interested in um, we're looking for and you can incorporate those terms obviously you know, being an, you know, an ethical job seeker you, you ha can only speak to what you actually know how to do but if you do know how to use or how to do the things that those terms re relate to then you can incorporate that same language into your resumes and then what we're going to be working on today the job application letter this kind of correspondence between the language that you use in your job seeking documents and the language used by job um, offering managers and companies uh, helps you not only be able to, to show that you know what kind of terminology, what kind of standards, what kinds of technologies are in use, uh, but it also you know, builds in a sense a kind of rapport between you and the mind, the the, the way that that person that's reviewing your resume thinks because they're going to be looking for those things. And also, as I warned you in our last class about the fact that before any human being looks at your resume, your cover letter, anything, is it's likely going to be scanned into a computer system. And those computer systems are going to pull out from your nice printed or emailed resume and job application. They're going to pull out the details and then populate a database that, that that company uses to evaluate people to determine whether they should get an interview or not. Because again, as I've mentioned before, the resume and the cover letter are not the things that get you the job. They are the things that get you the interview. And then once you're in the interview, your performance at that in that moment is what's going to then combined with the resume and cover letter as well as your references, determine whether you actually get an offer for the job. So right now we're focusing on just getting you that interview, getting you that opportunity. So again, because a computer is going to be looking at these things before you know, anyone else does, you want to make sure that you're using the, the correct terminology, the correct terms for like your major, for the discipline of study, for the type of career you're going into. And you also want those things to um, be able to show that you're like on the cutting edge, that you're someone that knows the latest stuff, that you know the things that they're actually looking for. 
because if there isn't that kind of correspondence in language and terminology in your resume and cover letter with what they're looking for, that's obviously going to put you in a, in a much lower position uh, in terms of whether you get an interview or not. Um, so again, you, you want to, to continue with looking at job listings, using that as a part of your research so that you create the best types of job seeking documents that are updated and that you are continuing to work on. That again, these documents that you make in my class should not be the last time you ever look at these documents again. You are creating right now basically those um, generic versions of your documents. But then, as I've mentioned before, these documents need to be customized whenever you're applying for those top like say 10 jobs that you want more than anything else because if you're not customizing and making those resumes and those cover letters really respond to those job ads you're less likely going to get that opportunity for an interview um, now obviously you don't have the time and energy probably to do that level of customization for every job you're applying for it would be great if you did but I think it comes down to prioritization um, and this is something I learned many years ago from my uncle Woodrow who's no longer with us but one of the things that he you know tried to teach me when I was younger and I didn't always listen to him was he would say Jake you got to have priorities in life you got to prioritize things and when it comes to you know, finding the job that you want getting into that career path that you are you know, preparing for through your education, uh, you really want to prioritize the activities that are going to get you the best chance of getting an interview. And that really starts with these documents and your job search uh, research into the different job ads that are out there. So with that skills resume, uh, returning to that, that really foregrounds what you're able to do. This is a great type of resume to use when you're just starting out. Um, now, that isn't true for everybody. Some of the folks in the class already have uh, a lot of career experience, uh, work experience in the field that you're looking for a career in. In those cases, that it might be better to use an experience-based resume. An experience-based resume is the traditional kind of resume where the work experience is what's foregrounded. And so you have the job, you have a title, you have a location, and then you have some bullet points underneath that highlight the primary responsibilities, the primary things that you knew how to do or that you accomplished on the job um, that you know, exemplify you as a worker with certain skills and abilities, not just you know, technical skills, but communication skills, managerial leadership skills. You want to emphasize and highlight those things that you did in those different types of jobs. And again, this is for the experience-based resume. Um, whereas with the skills resume, that's the kind of stuff that you're putting at the top and it's taken away from, from all the different work experiences you might have because the work experience you have might be none or it might be in jobs that aren't necessarily aligned with the type of career that you're pursuing. Um, so again, these two types of resumes are good to have on hand and you can customize them based on the type of job you want to apply for uh, and then customize them further based on you know, what is the specific job looking for and how does that correspond with what you're capable of doing, what you know how to do. I mean, you guys are really smart people. You know lots of things. That's what you should have been putting into that personal job seeking database document that we talked about a few weeks ago where you put down not just all the jobs you've had your education your GPA all the classes that you've taken um, at City Tech or if you and if you've transferred here from somewhere else you want to put all that down as well uh, but it should also include every type of skill you have every type of software and technology that you know how to use uh, every language you know how to speak and you need to quantify those things. Are you a novice in one language, but you know, a native speaker and, and um, reader and writer in another? You need to specify that. And then you can pull from that personal job seeking database document and funnel that information into your resumes and your uh, 
job application letter or cover letter that we're going to talk about today as well as your LinkedIn.com profile that you'll also be building as a part of this project. So um, for last week, just to complete the review, the weekly writing assignment, uh, which you should have had, you completed by today, but I know some people had some trouble accessing LinkedIn Learning through the New York Public Library's website. You know, these types of things are going to happen, um, and I don't want anybody to like blow a gasket when they do. But what I would ask you to do is that if you encounter technical problems with like using something like this for our class, the right thing to do is like let me know about it. But I also want you to be troubleshooting the problem on your end because, I mean, obviously, I, I'm not the New York Public Library. I can't fix a problem you might have with them. Uh, but it does let me know that, there's a, that you're having an issue with it. And so that is going to let me give you more latitude with getting the assignment done because obviously what's more important to me is you accomplishing the task, getting something out of it, even if it were to take you a few more days because of you, this technical problem you might have had accessing it. Uh, but just to look over there real quick, so here I am on the New York Public Library's website and the link that I gave you to the LinkedIn Learning entry in their databases. And again, this is a great resource that you have access to with a New York Public Library card, which if you don't already have one, you can also apply for one online and get instant access, uh, theoretically. Um, but with that library card and your PIN number, you click on that, and that's going to take you over to their website. We're going to take a look at it in a minute uh, for uh, today's work. Uh, but if you have trouble accessing it, on the same page that I gave you a link to, I want you to scroll down to the bottom. And they have this box right here of, of contact information. Need help? Ask New York Public Library. They have an option to email them with your problem. You can chat with a librarian during business hours. You can text them during business hours. You can call them and talk to somebody on the telephone during business hours. Um, they got you know two numbers here, and and also obviously if you, I haven't heard from anybody in the class about you know, needing any kind of accommodations, but if you or someone else you know needs accommodations, they also have um, you know TTY for folks that uh, have hearing disabilities. So you can like you uh, type and talk with someone that way as well. Um, so if you are having any kind of trouble accessing the LinkedIn Learning uh, database, these are resources you can use to um, find you. Know, let them know you're having a difficulty and let them know what the actual problem is. Don't say it isn't working. Let them know what, what you see happening uh, that isn't working. So like if you get an error message or something pops up that's weird, you can let them know. But now from my own experience, I'll also tell you like an easy fix that I found for a lot of problems with accessing databases, whether it be uh, through the New York Public Library or uh, with uh, our uh, library. Let's see if I, I don't have it open here right now, but I'll. So library.citytech.cuny.edu. So in both cases, when you're accessing um, things in databases, like whenever we go find articles, Go to find articles that we talked about before. Um, if whatever browser you're currently using is where you're seeing problems, first thing you could do is disable all the add-ons you have with that browser and then reload the site and see if you're able to access it then. If that doesn't work, switch to a different browser. Um, so like I prefer to use Firefox here uh, but with some websites and some databases, uh, Firefox doesn't always work. Uh, in which case, I just switch over to uh, Google Chrome. And so I'll bring it up here. Uh, we'll take a look at this in a little bit. But here I have LinkedIn Learning uh, up uh, with my account through the li New York Public Library's um, uh, databases. Uh, so earlier when I was trying to access it I wasn't able to log in on Firefox but I loaded it up on Chrome logged in no problem so that is usually a quick fix if you do run into some difficulty but if that doesn't fix the problem reach out to the New York Public Library folks because that's what they're there for they want to help you they want to you know, provide a solution and get you into that database that you have you know, privileged access by having a New York Public Library card. 
And again, if you haven't signed up for that yet, again, that's all free, okay? Um, just because you live here in New York, you have access to this as a resource. Uh, and if you missed the link that I gave you last week for getting a library card, you can see it right over here, get a library card. You click that and you can sign up online. You don't have to even go into a branch uh, to get you know, just a library card number and your PIN number that you need for accessing databases like LinkedIn Learning. All right, so do, 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 do. All right, so for last week's weekly writing assignment, the assignment was to get your library card if you didn't already have one, log into LinkedIn Learning uh, database, which again is a tremendous resource, which otherwise would cost you like 25 bucks a month, but you get free access through the, through, through the library's website uh, with a library card. And I wanted you to look around. I wanted you to explore, see what you can learn through it. Like I told you in our last lecture, you can learn anything on there. I mean, they, they have lessons for everything about how to program in different languages, how to even like just the basics of programming, how to use different software, uh, like you know Adobe Creative Suite and other things, uh, how to be a digital photographer, um, how to be a writer. I mean, all this kind of stuff is in, in there. And, and so, it's a resource that's free, but it's high quality uh, lectures and other supporting material like handouts, quizzes, and as I mentioned before, if you complete some of the courses on LinkedIn Learning, you essentially can earn badges that represent you've, you've actually completed those things, which you can put on your LinkedIn.com profile, which we're going to talk about during today's class for the job application portfolio. Again, you don't have to do that, but having some kind of credentialization, being able to, sh to prove in a sense that you've learned things or that you've gone through a course just the same way as you getting a degree from City Tech is like you know, a membership card. It's a way of being able to gain entrance or get noticed more than if you didn't have those things. Because I mean, it's one thing to be able to say like, oh, I know how to do everything in the world. I know everything there is under the sun. But unless you've got some way to prove that, um, you, you were, you're saying that doesn't carry any kind of weight with anybody. Um, and so you need to back things up. And again, the, this gets back to the stuff that I know you've been exposed to, like with English 1101, 1121, is that you always got to have evidence to back up your assertions. That if you're making an argument and that argument can be like, you know, I am an expert in this thing. Well, you got to have some way to back it up and prove that. And some of the ways that I've mentioned before that you can do that is, you know, for example, building an e-portfolio on OpenLab where you... Um, uh, curate in a sense like you bring together some of the projects that you've worked on in different classes over the years or you can create your own website where you can copy and paste and, and present some of the papers or projects that you've done in other classes as a way to show you've put in that energy and work that you know how to document sources you know how to use I triple E uh, E style that kind of stuff um, really, you want to be able to show that you know how to do this stuff. Because in a sense, it's like picks or didn't happen. you got to be able to show and have some kind of evidence that you know how to do these things as well, in addition to having you know, that, that membership card of your degree or other credentializations. Um, you're getting certifications from like Cisco, uh, from Microsoft, etc. Um, so the weekly writing assignment, again, you explored LinkedIn Learning, you wrote me a memo about 250 words in length. Um, you're talking about what you found there, what you thought might be interesting, something maybe you might want to return to later on your own. Uh, but that was really an exercise to get you more familiar with the platform because we're going to be using it uh, this week to help you prepare uh, your LinkedIn.com profile. And then your homework uh, for this past week was to create two uh, basic resumes, you know, one being the experience-based and one being the skills-based resume. Um, I gave you the, the templates to work with after you put in your information. You know, you want to hide the table lines. Remember I told you you might have to like Google to figure out how to do that. That's, that's basic problem solving. You have this tremendous resource at your fingertips. Make use of it because uh, there's all gobs of information out there both on the web or on YouTube and other places where you can find out how to do that. But the idea is like you build those 
uh, resumes with the information from your personal job seeking database uh, and hold on to them once you've got them. You want to save them. Make sure you have them save some place safe. And then next week, uh, we're going to take those two resumes and we're going to take your job application letter and your LinkedIn.com profile that you're working on this week and then we're going to begin doing peer review and I'll explain all of that in next week's lecture. We're going to use email to coordinate because um, you know, we have a small class so it'll be easy for us to do that um, but I'll explain all that in next week's lecture. So all you got to do as far as uh, your homework is concerned with making these deliverables, you know, the documents for the job application portfolio is hold on to them. You don't have to show them to me uh, yet. We're going to be doing some more things with them to make sure they're as polished as you want before I get a chance to grade them. So with that quick overview of what we've done so far and what we did last week as I think as I've mentioned before it's good for us to kind of reflect on where we've been so that it helps us situate ourselves in the present as we move through the semester in this asynchronous class because I don't want anybody getting lost uh, as we move through this because uh, I know some students have said they haven't taken asynchronous classes before so I know that this can be um, challenging you know so we're trying to build in these these techniques um, like review, reflection, etc., to make sure that you kind of can see where we've gone, what we're working on, and then where we're heading to. So with the review done, uh, let's take a look at what we're going to do this week. And that's going to be project one continued. This is the job application portfolio continued. And this week we're going to be working on the job application letter and the LinkedIn.com profile. Uh, and then later on in the lecture, we'll talk about the weekly writing assignment and this week's homework. Um, so let's take a look first at that job application letter. And so with the job application letter, what's otherwise called the cover letter, and again, like if you got your Cornell Method notebooks out over on your keyword side, you should say job application letter slash cover letter so that you know they're the same thing when someone talks about them. But What's key to thinking about this letter is that it makes an argument. So, I mean, we're going straight back to those things you've already worked on before in English 1101 and your other writing classes where you make an assertion and then you're backing it up with some kind of details, some evidence. Now, the argument that you're wanting to make in a, in a cover letter is that you're qualified, that you're the right person for the job being advertised, that you can add value to the company. Again, if you remember from last week, uh, when you're writing those objective statements on your resumes, you don't want to say for a job you're applying for, you know, it's different for an internship, but for a job, you don't want to say anything about like um, how you're know, working for this company is going to be a great experience for you that you're looking forward to learning a lot from the company. Um, as far as the company is concerned, that's bullshit. Okay, What they're concerned with is what kind of value you're going to add to the company. How are you going to make the company uh, able to do the things that it needs to get done? If you can do that and you can do it well or do it better than other people, well, they want to hire you. If you can't do those things or can't do them better than someone else, well, they don't want you. They're not interested in what you're getting out of the bargain for the most part. But now, as I said before uh, in last week's lecture, when you apply for an internship, things are a little bit different. Even though you still might be using these same types of documents, they may ask for a resume, they may ask for a cover letter. Uh, but in that case, you're wanting to do two things for an internship. One, you are wanting to show like you do have some skills, you do have some experience, like you want to talk about what you've learned in your classes. You might have some work experience that's relevant. Um, you might, and I think you, you are developing good communication skills, which you would also want to make mention of because communication skills are one of the, the, the leading ways to distinguish yourself from someone else that might be qualified for a given job. I mean, I, I think you have the technical chops for like what it is you want to be doing. 
But then it's going to come down to whether you're able to work with other people, whether you're good at communicating what you work on to others. Um, these are key things that you want to be thinking about how to you know, talk about that and how to communicate that to someone that may be offering you an interview for an internship or for a job. But again, with the internship, you do want to specify how you're going to bring something to the table or what you know how to do. But it, then it's also okay to talk about what you're going to be getting out of this experience. So for example, if uh, you are applying for an internship uh, at a Microsoft or a Google, well, you may want to talk about like how you your dream is to work for you know, one of the leading, largest, um, and most significant technical uh, companies um, in the world. And you, with this opportunity of an internship, you will be able to do that. You'll be able to, to see what it's like to work for one of these great companies. Um, and again, I'm playing that up a little bit. You can do that as well. But if you're applying for an internship at like say a small startup, you'll probably want to specify like you're looking forward to getting the, you know, the experience of working at a dynamic and um, uh, you know, um, ah, brain is not working. Uh, the, the kind of workplace that is rapidly changing, that's very nimble, word I was looking for. Um, dexterous is another word that I was looking for. Uh, place that has to you know work lean, uh, but uh, while also trying to produce you know, real results. Because working for a startup is completely different than working for one of those big established companies. Because I mean, those other companies have like more money than God, right? They can like do almost anything. Uh, they're able to you know within reason uh, provi provide for different projects. Um, you know, if they're the kind of projects that the company wants to pursue. Whereas like a startup uh, is in a much more precarious place, right? And so if you're looking for an internship at a startup versus like one of these big companies, you'd wanna talk about like, not just that you have these skills, this education uh, for um, helping that startup, you know, um, become profitable, for example, but that you're also looking forward to working for a place that is high pressure, uh, that is having to be lean in its resources, that is a dynamic place to work at. Um, because that shows not only that you, you are aware of the type of place that it is you're applying to work, but it also acknowledges that you're going to be getting some practical workplace experience out of it. And again, that's okay for an internship application. But for a job application, uh, we don't wanna talk about what you're getting out of um, working there. That is something though that you can bring up like during an interview when they ask if you have questions. Um, and we'll talk about that you know, uh, next week. But at least for right now, um, with these documents, we don't go there, okay? When you're applying for a job. And then returning to the argument that you're qualified, you add value to the company, and that you deserve an interview. They, this is what you're trying to get across to whoever uh, is reading this cover letter that you've written for them. Now, the supporting evidence to back up that argument, to support that argument, right, is that you wanna add details. You wanna maybe give a story or an anecdote um, about relevant details that are on your resume. You see, the resume and the cover letter work together. Um, if something is on the resume that's kind of a big deal, you want to make sure that gets mentioned and elaborated on in the cover letter. Because the resume, you got one page to present everything about you that's relevant for you to get that job. The cover letter gives you the opportunity, again, I didn't mention this, but again, in one page to elaborate and explain and give details about some of the key points that are on the resume that supports you getting that interview for that job. Now, the cover letter can't include everything on the resume, okay? But 
you want to choose those things that are most relevant for the job you're applying for from the resume to talk further about in the cover letter. And then of course when you're in your interview you might be able to elaborate even further because you know one page isn't a lot of words. One page single spaced so that's roughly 500 words. You're not going to have any more than that. One page single spaced that's the cover letter. And some of the the space is taken up for uh, you know important details like the date that you send it, um, the address of who you're and the name of the person you're sending it to, um, and your information, your contact information. Um, and as I'll talk about in a minute, it's important for you to include all this information, even though it does take away space from your, what you can include, but. I think this is good for the way that we write these documents to keep our writing lean to the point giving enough detail but then not also not turning the cover letter into like you know, uh, the great American novel because you also don't want to bore your audience you don't want to go off on a tangent with something that you're writing about you want to have a laser like focus on you know, what it is you're capable of doing and those details that you give in the cover letter that correspond with those laser-like you know, um, focus that you give about your qualifications in the resume. Um, so you always want to make sure you're not wasting the space that you have available to make your argument, to make your case by going off and using you know, you know, too many details, uh, using empty language and words that don't mean anything. Everything always needed to be focused on your argument in the cover letter and then your qualifications on the resume. Now these are some things to get down into your notes about like the letter parts and we're going to take a look at a sample letter uh, but these are the main parts that you want to include in your job uh, application letter or cover letter. You want to include your address, uh, like your mailing address, and the date that you're sending the letter. Uh, and this includes even if you're sending it electronically, like as an attachment on an email or uploading it to an, a job application website. Uh, you want to include the name, title, and address of the addressee. Now this is key. A lot of job ads that you might find there should be somewhere that there is a name of a person who is the person, uh, like the, the point person or contact person for that position should you have any questions. That can be who you address this to. Now sometimes they may not include that information, in which case you can do some research to try to figure out who that person might be. And even if you happen to pick the wrong person for uh, addressing the letter, I don't think that's going to, to do you any harm. Uh, in fact, it shows like you are trying to show some initiative to figure out who you should be addressing this to. But again, like if there is a contact email uh, or phone number on the job ad, you can even call them and you, you professionally, politely introduce yourself on the phone saying that you're interested in applying for this job. Um, but you wanted to maybe ask some questions about it. like you may have some questions based on the job ad itself but then you can also ask you know, who should I address my cover letter to I didn't see like you know, someone's name on the job ad on monster.com for example and whoever you're speaking with I will be happy to give you those details again make sure that you got your know, pen and paper handy so you can jot that down you don't want to be on the phone and then they say oh yeah you want to you address it to so and so and then you're saying oh hold on a second I still gotta go get a pen and paper that that looks unprofessional you want to be prepared before you make that phone call to be able to jot everything down that the person tells you you take notes on that phone call basically and if you know I think this is one of the ways that you can really show you're being professional that you're showing respect to the, to whoever's doing the hiring or whoever's responsible for reviewing the applications or conducting interviews by doing this. After that, you want to give a salutation, uh, you know, dear Mr. So-and-so, Miss So-and-so. 
Uh, if you know, like depending on where you're applying, the person may also like have a higher you know, degree, like you know, they may have a doctorate and they may be a doctor. So if that's the case, make sure you say, dear doctor so-and-so, uh, rather than addressing them as Mr. or Mrs. Um, then in the actual body of your letter, you'll want to first talk about the position that you're applying for using the actual position name. And if there's a reference number, include that as well. Where you saw the job ad that you're the, the position you're applying for, and then your thesis statement. Your, your thesis statement basically is going to lay out that you are the best candidate for that job, and you're going to use the word because, and then after because, you're going to give basically a roadmap for what follows in the rest of your letter, which are going to be the reasons. Whenever you say because, you're going to follow it up with some reasons why you're the best candidate for that job. And we'll see some details of that when we look at the sample cover letter in just a minute. Um, but that roadmap, and the way that I say it is a roadmap, should correspond with the following paragraphs of your letter. And I would recommend breaking everything up, like each part uh, that's supporting your thesis statement should be its own little paragraph. Don't have like a letter that's like a huge block of text that's hard to read, a uh, person can get lost in it. Break things up into smaller chunks especially considering the fact that the person might be reading this on a computer screen. And on computer screens, we know that it's easier to read things in chunks rather than in long blocks of text, like in a book. Um, so try to make things as easy for whoever's reading this as possible. And again, like I've said before, you make their job easier, that wins you points in a sense. Um, I mean, I'm not necessarily saying that like by doing it, they're gonna be thinking, oh yeah, you're the right person for the job but at least you're not giving them an excuse to hate you, all right? You don't want them to hate you for any reason um, and to give them any reason to reject you, to send you to the trash, right? And that could be anything from like a typo, misspellings, um, you know, problems with like, you know, grammar or syntax in your sentences. Uh, you gotta make things completely polished and as perfect as possible. So they have no reason whatsoever to ignore your um, cover letter and resume. So those smaller paragraphs then would be the body paragraphs that support the thesis argument. Those are each paragraph should be about like one thing that you elaborate on that corresponds to something in your resume that supports you being the right person for the job. Then you want to conclude with a very short paragraph that includes your contact details. Well, you already gave your address at the top of the letter, so your contact details in this case should be your phone number and email address. Well, you may be saying, well, Professor Ellis, I already include that on the resume. I don't need to include that here. Yes, you do. Because if someone has actually printed this thing out and for whatever reason your resume gets lost or the fact the person is going to have to ruffle through papers to find your contact information, Again, make their job easier. So by putting your contact information in multiple places, it makes their job a little bit easier if they do actually want to contact you. And if you want them to contact you, you want to do everything you can to make that easier on them. So put this in multiple places, your contact information. Then at the bottom of your letter, you want to give a, con a closing, you know, sincerely, comma, Underneath your closing, you want to have a signature. So like you want to make a digital signature, you can just like draw it out like on a trackpad or on a tablet or on a phone and save that um, as an image that you can then put into your word processing document. Um, or a lot of word processors have drawing tools that you can use like with, the, with a mouse or with a touchpad to draw out your signature. It doesn't have to be perfect, but make it you know, so it, it, it looks as good as possible. And then underneath your signature, give your full name or how you, you present your name uh, professionally. And then at the bottom, you should make a note of enclosure uh, that you're enclosing a resume, maybe enclosing your e-portfolio link, whatever it might be that goes along with the cover letter. So let's take a look at a sample cover letter 
together. There we go. All right, so this is responding to a job ad that I found uh, a couple of years ago on monster.com uh, with Somerset Technology Group uh, in New Jersey. And I'm using uh, the George P. Burdell character, uh, you, just using some details from my life to fill things in, um, but it's under his name uh, from uh, the resumes that I'd already given you examples of. Remember, George P. Burdell was the name at the top of those. And uh, did anybody look up who George P. Burdell is? You ought to. Google search. Find out like you're where I'm getting that from. All right, so looking at this letter, at the very top, and again, this is a business format letter, okay? This isn't like a letter that you're going to write on stationery with like little flowers and, and frilly things. This needs to be like just your writing on a plain white sheet of paper, okay? Um, and we're diving straight into um, what kind of information we need to present to the reader um, in this type of letter. And again, remember, as I said before, these things are being read by machines, so you don't want to include anything that's going to like screw up the way that it gets scanned and OCR, optical character rec recognition, uh, and input it into the computer database. Um, so you use like you know a basic font, like here I'm using Times New Roman. Um, you can also you use any of the built-in fonts that come like with Microsoft Word or Google Docs but don't use something that's like you know really strange or weird or makes it seem like you're a robot uh, for the type of font that you're using or that you're from the matrix i mean those fonts look fun uh, like if you're building a website or making a poster but not obviously right for whenever we're writing a business letter uh, like a job application letter or cover letter so at the very top uh, oh and one thing i'll mention here first is I played with the margins, and this is something that's okay to do. Uh, I set the margins to half an inch all the way around, top, bottom, and sides. And that gives me a little bit more space for me to, to write um, my letter uh, and gives me more words, basically, to work with. Now, you don't want to probably go less than half an inch because, as I mentioned before, some printers don't or aren't capable of printing less than half of inch margins. And so if you were to have quarter inch margins and the person tries to print this out for whatever reason at the, on their work printer, they can't do that. It's just going to hack off you know, that part of your writing and make your letter look weird and you don't want that. So again, make things easier for whoever's receiving this by you thinking about what limitations, you know, what affordances and constraints are the two key words we're using here. Affordances are what you know a piece of technology can do, and the constraints are the things that it can't do. Uh, so we want to be mindful of that whenever we're creating these documents. So at the top of my letter, I start with my address. So you want to put your address there, not your name or anything, just your street address, uh, your city, state, zip code, and then on the line underneath, uh, you want to give the date that you're going to be sending the letter. Uh, and you want to be mindful of like if there's a deadline for the job ad. If there is, obviously you want to be sending it before that deadline. Um, also, whatever word processor that you're using, you want to make sure that you don't have it set to add space after a hard return. A hard return is when you press enter or return on your keyboard. Um, like Microsoft Word, for example, likes to default to adding, um, I think like the default right now currently is 10 points after a hard return. And we don't want that. We want each of the lines that you see here to be generated by pressing enter on the keyboard, nothing else. That way you have complete control over what you see on the page. Um, no automatic weird stuff by whatever word processor you're using. Again, this is where Google comes in handy for you to figure out how to change these kinds of settings in whatever word processor you use. So after the date, I pressed enter once 
and then I pressed enter again to go to this being the fifth line. And then here, I put the name of the contact person at the company, John Gieski, comma, space, and then I gave his work title, managing member, okay? Then on the next line, I put in the name of the company that's offering the job, Somerset Technology Group, and then I gave their address, uh, street address, unit number, and then the city, state, and zip code. Then I pressed enter once and then enter again for my salutation, though like where I'm, who I'm addressing. And in this case, I say, dear Mr. Gaski, comma. Then I pressed enter again and pressed enter a second time. And this is where I begin the body of my letter. And it's this first paragraph where I want to say what I'm applying for, where I saw the ad at, and what is my thesis statement. Now it's important to mention where you saw a job ad because that is useful information to the company so they know where they're getting applicants from. Um, and you also want to use the exact language in the job ad for the position that you're applying for. In this case, the job ad said this was for technical support engineer slash help desk manager. Now some ads will include like a reference number and in parentheses after whatever the title of the job is, in parentheses, you can put that reference number. That also helps them know specifically which job you're applying for because they may be hiring for 12 different help desk managers but like at different uh, offices throughout the company. So you need to include that reference number so they know which one specifically you're going to be applying for. So I begin by saying, I am applying for the position of technical support engineer slash help desk manager advertised on monster.com, period, space. And this, is, this next sentence is where I'm going to begin making my argument and giving a roadmap for the rest of the letter. I believe that my work experience, comma, educational background, comma, and commitment to helping others use computer technology would make me a valuable contributor to the work that you do at Somerset Technology Group. So a few things here. This part right here, work experience, comma, educational background, comma, and commitment to helping others use computer technology those three things are the roadmap for my letter. Those are the three main topics that I'm going to talk about. And each of these are represented by their own paragraph. So there's one paragraph for work experience, that's this first one. Educational background, that's the second paragraph. And commitment to helping others, that's the third paragraph down here. And you want your paragraphs to follow whatever you your roadmap you supply. Now your roadmap may be completely different than this. Um, you may want to lean heavily on your educational experience. You might want to include, excuse me, one uh, component of your roadmap to be about maybe a, a team project you worked on in a class or as part of an internship, in which case that can be its own thing in that list and then you write a paragraph about that. But you figure out, based on the type of job you're applying for and what experiences and knowledge you have, to think, you know, what specific details can I give about what I'm capable of doing and what I've done in the past that makes me right for this job? And those will be the things that you want to include. You might include you know, three, maybe four smaller paragraphs, but I wouldn't go beyond that. Uh, I think three is good because it gives you three different aspects of your, you know, your experience being prepared for a job uh, and gives you space to write about them without seeming too brief. But if you were to go below three, you could write more, but is it giving a full and accurate and as broad a picture of yourself as you really want to give? So I think the sweet, the sweet spot number is three. Um, but I'm not saying that's the only way to do it. Um, 
you you can gauge that on your own and maybe also as I mentioned before you want to talk to your professors in your major uh, to get an idea of like you know what what they recommend and maybe they can even give you like their like sample documents and maybe they even share like their own uh, documents if they've worked in uh, the private sector before with you uh, as a way to kind of see what they've done before that may give you more ideas so again this isn't the only way that I'm showing you this is one amongst many ways now after I've given that roadmap I, this is where I'm making the argument that I would make a valuable contributor to the work that you do at Somerset Technology Group. I did this on purpose to include the name of the company again because I want to be able to, one to show like this letter is customized for Somerset Technology Group. It's not like you know a, a carbon copied boilerplate letter that I send everywhere um, but also it you know, the someone that works at Somerset is going to think is kind of cool that you're, like, you're mentioning them in the letter by name uh, rather than that you're just saying that you'd be a valuable contributor to the work that you do, period. Just that isn't as impressive. You want to include the name again of the company if you can. Now this first um, main body paragraph here, this is corresponding to the work experience part of my roadmap. My 10 years of work experience at MindSpring Internet gives me a practical knowledge of a range of Windows-based operating systems and server-side applications. I worked with a team of support members who collaborated on solving difficult client problems and supported one another's ongoing technical training through workshops and technical tools, such as the web-based virtual applications that I built for our team and share on my professional blog. And I just made like a domain name for that. These gave team members visual cues of the client side operating systems and applications they were supporting over the phone and by email. While I do not have an MCSC certification, I believe that my experience in technical support tools demonstrate my technical know-how and professionalization in the IT field. All right, so what's going on here? So I'm trying to sh illustrate as best I can in these few sentences, not only the practical work that I did at MindSpring, that I worked with like Windows-based operating systems and server-side applications, but I also signaled that I worked with a team and that team collaborated, so I had to work with other people on solving difficult problems. That's a good keyword to throw in there and that we also supported one another with training uh, through workshops and technical tools. And then I give an example of one of those technical tools, uh, a virtual, you know, a set of virtual applications that I built um, and made available online at the time. And then I slip in a link. Again, you might include that link for your, your personal or professional blog on your resume, but why not put it in the letter again as, as another chance that the person who's looking at this may click on it and see what, you, what you've been doing there. Um, and then I further elaborate on those virtual applications. These gave team, member, team members visual cues of the stuff that we worked on. Um, and the job ad specifically asked for someone with MCSC certification. So here I'm giving you an example where even though a job ad asks for something, if you can give a reason why you are still capable of doing the job without that thing they're asking for, like they may ask for five years work experience or ask for different certifications. If you can account in some way why you're still qualified for the job, you should apply for that job and include that information in your resume and in your job letter. Doesn't necessarily mean you're going to call back, uh, but you're making every possible effort to, to make the case that you're still the right person for the job. Uh, but that should still tell you though, as you're doing research on these job ads, if every job ad is asking for a specific certification that you don't have, you damn well sure should be looking into getting that certification because that's something that it, again it's like a membership card you got to do those things to get just your foot in the door to be noticed 
Um, not always. There are cases where you can still get a foot in the door without some of those things, but you got to maybe have four out of the five requirements, right? It's like if you only got one of the five requirements, that's probably not going to be enough. Um, but you can still try to account for things as best as possible uh, in the letter and in your resume with those details. Now, the second paragraph, this one corresponds to the educational background part of my roadmap. While working full-time at MindSpring, I completed a Bachelor of Science in Professional and Technical Communication degree at the New York City College of Technology a senior college within the City University of New York. So just in like this first sentence, I'm talking about the degree I got. Again, I'm, it's basically copying what's in the resume, right? But here I give a little bit more details about what City Tech is, a senior college within the City University of New York. Everybody doesn't know what, much less what City Tech is or the fact that we're part of CUNY. So you need to give some qualifying words to explain that to whoever's reading this so that they learn something and see why it's impressive that you are coming from this institution. Then I give more details about um, the, the degree that, that George P. Burdell got. This program empowered me to specialize in computer information systems while developing a stronger communication and collaboration skill set. So like with the PTW program, you specialize in a field of study at City Tech. It could be CIS, it could be physics, it could be chemistry, et cetera. Uh, but in this case, because this is a computer job, I said CIS. Um, continuing, I developed heuristics. Heuristics is a, a fancy word for shortcuts. It means like you learn like how to uh, do a kind of thing a process, for example, but that you repurpose that process in other domains of your life. Something you might have learned in like, say, a math class, you think, well, you know, I could modify that a little bit and use it like for writing a computer program or for like figuring out the, the optimal way to prioritize uh, my week, right? A heuristic is like these shortcuts that we learn in one domain, but then reapply them to others. I developed heuristics for managing time, resources, and people by taking leadership on several major projects. So here I'm just talking about George P. Burdell's educational projects that he worked on. Even though I'm applying for this job, if I haven't worked in projects like you know, in the workplace, I'm going to talk about what I, I do have experience with, which would be things in classes, including one in which I led a team of four peers to write a report on the public-facing Wi-Fi authentication system, comma, create brochures to help students connect their digital devices to the network, comma, and deliver a presentation to campus stakeholders about how to improve access for students. So then I break down all the things that we did in that project um, as a way of showing off, like I know how to work with, or George P. Burdell knows how to work with technical tools, to work with people, to create different types of communication deliverables. All these kinds of things are wrapped up into just that one sentence. These communication skills combined with my past technical work experience would enable me to manage the help desk team and create a set of training materials and modules for new hires. And so here in the job listing, it actually talked about that part of the responsibility would be for onboarding new hires would be some of the responsibilities you would have. Well, I want to put in my letter that I could do that kind of that part of the work in order to satisfy the requirements of the job. This is the kind of customization you need to do for some of the letters that you write where you take the language and the responsibilities from the job ad and then you address how you would be either doing them or qualified to do them in your job letter. Then next to last um, this paragraph here, the third like main body paragraph, corresponds to this commitment to helping others use computer technology. Again, this is I'm just trying to think of anything that George P. Burdell can respond to, uh, showing that he has technical chops and likes to do things with technology with other people. Um, because one of the things you think about like a help desk, you want to like helping other people, right? So this was something I, I thought important to include. 
from when I was a leader in the Boy Scouts and teaching my father how to get online and send an email to now when I help others use internet technology in the workplace and in nonprofit groups like the Science Fiction Research Association, comma, I enjoy working with others and taking the lead to support the goals of my organization. I would like to carry on helping others, clients and coworkers, by joining the team at Somerset Technology Group. So that first really long clunky sentence, I admit that's not the best sentence in the world, but I tried to pack into it all these different ways that I've enjoyed helping others with technology from when uh, George P. Burdell was young to more recent time. And then conclude that paragraph with the zinger like, you know, he wants to continue doing this for Somerset Technology Group, right? So you're saying you enjoy this stuff. I also want to enjoy doing it at your company, basically. And then the last paragraph, this is where we wrap it up. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact me by phone. Give your phone number again. Uh, and then here I say, or by email. And then again, use your City Tech email address. That shows, that proves that you're a student here. When you're using like a Gmail or at some rando.com email address, unless it's like your own, like you have like you know, a vanity domain name or your own personal website, this is an easy way just to prove that you are a student at City Tech because you won't have that email address unless you were a student uh, currently going there or that you graduated because you get to keep your email address uh, as an alumni. Now after that sentence uh, I write, I would of course be very happy to meet you at your convenience for an interview. I mean, of course you'd be happy to do that. I thank you for your consideration and look forward to hearing from you soon, period. Uh, skip a line, then sincerely comma, then skip four lines and in that four line space is where you want to put your signature. After your signature, you want to spell out your name, however you sign it, so in this case, George P. Burdell, and then the very last line, enclosure, co uh, colon, space, resume. That's all you got to say, unless you include other stuff. You say resume and uh, portfolio, uh, or your sa writing sample, whatever it is they might ask for, you, you would say enclosure and say what those things are. All right, so this is a sample job application letter. Um, it's already on our Open Lab site. It's under last week's weekly writing assignment as a link, uh, so you can access it there. Um, and you can you know, read over it and use this as a model to get some ideas. Uh, but you can also look online for, for other models. Um, you know, I mentioned, um, had you read previously the, the second chapter from um, Williams Technical Communication that was available on archive.org um, and it also has some sample job application letters in that chapter so review that go back to that link that I gave you before uh, and look at those models and of course you can do a Google search for like cover letter sample and then maybe uh, include like what you know a career or field that you're going into um, as a part of your search terms to find something you know, suited to what you're looking for. You're like, you don't necessarily want to be looking at a cover letter for a type of career that's totally unrelated to what you're doing uh, or that you intend to do. Uh, so look for models. And this is something um, you can also talk to your other professors, talk to your advisor about, um, and ask them for help with locating some of these types of documents to help you. Maybe not necessarily write this very second for the purposes of our class. You may not have time to do that. But in the long term, this is what you'll want to do. And this, these types of things I, I suggest for you to do are, are not things that I don't do myself. Uh, just to show you, like here is a folder in my documents folder that I labeled CV. Things are a little different for how we do things uh, for professors getting jobs. Like I have a CV, a curriculum vitae, instead of a resume. But in this folder, I include a lot of other things besides my CV. Like you can see, I think I'm using um, LibreOffice now to work on my CV. So this is my main CV document. 
but I have past versions like your CV 2020. I have a digital, just a JPEG that I made of my digital signature that I can drop into any document that I need to sign, including uh, like a CV or a job application letter. Uh, I have headshots that I include like on my profile on different websites where I might be advertising the work that I do. I have documents that I created of different versions of my biography. Like here's a long one, here's one that's 100 words long, here's the latest one that's 100 words long. Uh, but I also include a folder that I download of models of CVs, of people that I respect, um, that, I, that are people in my profession, and I, I learn from their CVs to think like, oh, I didn't think to include that kind of thing on my document, so I need to talk about or list that on my CV. Um, so look for models by other people, other professionals, um, Talking to your professors is a great way to, to get access to some of those, but also rely on social media and um, Google searches to find other models that might be helpful to you, um, specifically looking for those in your field. All right, so that's the job application letter. And so what do we need to go to next, which will be LinkedIn.com. Uh, all right, so this is some stuff I had mentioned in the week two lecture, but I, I just want to uh, speak to it again very quickly. Now, for the purposes of our uh, job application portfolio in this project, which is required as a part of the English 1133 class uh, on the course learning outcomes, you do have to create a LinkedIn.com profile which we're going to talk about in a minute. But I would recommend that you also create profiles on other job search websites like monster.com, indeed.com, glassdoor.com, and keep them updated. Um, one of the reasons for this, besides it's kind of important for most professionals, particularly professionals in the fields that uh, folks are graduating uh, into from City Tech. Um, need to have some kind of online professional presence. It, in many ways, it looks weird if you don't have that online presence in some way, because when you apply for a job, um, two things can happen. One is if maybe if it's a smaller outfit, uh, whoever is doing um, evaluation of the job job application materials will Google you and they will look to see if they can find anything about you online. If they find nothing, that's going to be kind of strange nowadays, particularly for professionals going into technology fields. But m more than likely what will happen is, especially for larger firms, they pay companies whose sole job is to um, scrape the internet for any instance of your name, uh, your likeness, I mean, the, even some of these companies are using facial recognition technologies to pour through images uh, to create essentially a dossier on applicants. This way they can like see your Facebook, doc, your Facebook um, uh, profile. They'll be able to see um, social media posts on different websites. Uh, they might even be able to see other social media accounts that you have. Um, but basically, anywhere that you have been online, and, and some of those things you might have tried to hide, right? You might have used different you know, usernames. But what's very scary about some of these platforms, some of these companies that offer these services to companies, is that they are very good at, at least those that are the most successful, are very good at building connections between different profiles. Uh, it could be you use the same email address or a similar address or that you might have shared friends that show some kind of correspondence between two different social media accounts. So even though you may have one social media account that you consider your, your professional or public facing profile and another profile that's your wild and crazy private profile, these companies more than likely will find both of them 
and they will link the two together in the way that they present this information to you know, a given company. Um, you know, as far as these companies are concerned, you know, you shouldn't be thinking like, well, you have a right to privacy or anything like that because, well, one, you're giving this information freely to a third party, which that is you're cutting off any kind of sense of privacy. But also, this isn't the federal government we're talking about. These are private companies, and they can do whatever they want to within the law. The Fourth Amendment protects you against privacy violations by the government. So it's important to be very, very aware of everything that you put online. And you should have the understanding anything you do put online or that someone else puts online about you, like say, like a, take a picture of you at a party and they tag you, right? Any of that is going to be online forever. Uh, it's going to be cached, copied, taken down somewhere by someone. And it, it's not just like these companies that you know, create these dossiers for companies hiring people, uh, but there's also people that, that scrape this information for other purposes, whether it be um, to create like online bots for lots of nefarious purposes, or simply to try to monetize some of the things that you may say or do online. Like for example, um, with my blog, my, my blog's not a big deal. I mean, it's been online for over 10 years and I, I've written a whole lot of words on it. Uh, but there are companies that have made copies of my website. They basically take all the writing, but they strip out any time my name is mentioned. And then they put a lot of ads on their version of my website. And so they make money off the things that I've you know, put my work and my time into. Um, by doing that. So there are these other types of entities out there that do things that, that aren't above board, but nevertheless, they're there. So what I'm getting at is you need to be very cautious about what you put online, very intentional about what you put online. And for anything that you have put online in the past, I highly recommend here that you scrub the internet of your past accounts, posts, messages, images, etc. And that may mean that you need to go back and rack your brain about any like message board or old proto social media website, Friendster, uh, Tumblr, any of these different websites uh, that you might have had an account on, log into them and delete those accounts. If there is any chance there could be anything on there that doesn't look good for you uh, and put you in the best possible light. Um, and then for those social media accounts and online websites like LinkedIn.com or Facebook or anything else that you might use, you want to professionalize them as much as possible. Um, and, and what I mean by that is you know, consider like which, what kind of image you use for your profile picture, um, what kinds of content you might share on those websites. Uh, again, even though like you, you have a right to free speech, Again, that's something that protects you from your government. Um, you know, trying to you know, say what you can or can't say in public. Um, you can put post whatever you want to on your Facebook account or other social media websites, but there can be consequences from not just like your friends and family, but also the companies that may want or that may decide whether they employ you or not. And so you need to reflect on that. Um, and I'm not saying there's a right thing to say or not say, but just be aware that you other people will be looking at what you post online and there can be consequences to it, good and bad. Um, and that's something that we each have to find some way to navigate you know, in our lives and especially our professional lives but it's something you just, that I want you to be aware of. Now, once you've professionalized all these different accounts, I recommend that you create links and connections between them. So like LinkedIn.com is really great for aggregating, meaning bringing together all your different um, you know, websites, uh, social media accounts, anything that you want to reflect you, yourself professionally. And so you can add links to those things. So like if you build an ePortfolio on OpenLab, you can, you'll have a link to your ePortfolio that you can add to your LinkedIn.com profile uh, so that there, someone that goes to LinkedIn.com can say, oh, I see he has an online portfolio where he's done a lot of 
you know, documents that he's created and other things that he's worked on. Click on that and that carries them over to Open Lab where they can see all this other stuff that you've done. So another thing about LinkedIn um, that's very important and, and these other websites as well uh, is how important it is to um, connect with other professionals in the field, both for opportunities, to share ideas, to learn from one another, but also so that you're, in a sense, always have a job-seeking presence online because you know, your work circumstance may change. You could get laid off. You may start you know, hating your workplace for whatever reason. And by having you know, an online presence like LinkedIn.com, uh, a profile there, not only do you, does it show like the work that you're doing and what you're capable of, but if you update it regularly, and I recommend that it be something that you update once a week, once a month, um, once a quarter maybe, so that it's that you're always keeping it alive and fresh, and that you're taking time, you know, once a week, once a month maybe, to send messages to some of your connections, to maintain the connection. Because LinkedIn.com is not like Facebook, where you have like a million friends. Some people do that, but I think that's actually not that valuable and useful because you want the connections on LinkedIn.com to reflect you as a professional. You want them to be meaningful connections. So that if you need to ask somebody a favor, those connections you have on LinkedIn.com, at least those that you foster, you send a message to every now and again to see how they're doing, what they've been working on lately, share what you've been working on, that kind of stuff, um, can create a strong connection that might be beneficial both to you and those people you're connected to in the future. Additionally, a lot of people get jobs on LinkedIn.com uh, through recruiters. Uh, recruiters will plug in, use the search on LinkedIn.com and these other websites uh, to, to find people that are qualified for different kinds of jobs. And they will do initial interviews and then open the door essentially for an interview at a company or a subcontractor of a company. My wife got her current job this way. Uh, I know several people that have gotten jobs through recruiters who reached out to them instead of them applying for those jobs directly themselves. So by having this presence, you're essentially putting up a sign to recruiters like, hey, I'm someone you can talk to uh, if I qualify for a job that you know about. All right, so how about let's talk now about uh, your LinkedIn.com profile. Um, and then we'll conclude today's lecture with your weekly writing assignment and then the homework that you need to get done before next week. Let's see. This is a document that I'm going to uh, share with you. I'll add it to um, this week's weekly writing assignment so you can find it easily. Uh, but this document goes over the basics of a LinkedIn.com profile. And the objective for our class and the job search um, portfolio is that you create a completely filled out profile on LinkedIn.com. Excuse me. So the, the basic parts of your profile when you sign up on LinkedIn.com to create an account, you know, it has your name, uh, it has like your current job title, uh, if you if you are currently employed, uh, includes the area in which you work, uh, and it'll give some information at the top like your previous employment if you've had multiple jobs and it'll also include where you either are earning or have earned a degree. So like in this case, this guy went to University of California, Berkeley, a very prestigious school. And also importantly, it includes a profile picture. Now the picture doesn't need to be like, uh, you don't need to get like Annie Leibovitz to take your photo, okay? But what I would recommend is that you do wear like a nice shirt. It only needs to be 
um, you know, a face shot where like you see like your shoulders and you see your head and, and your hair, right? And then you have like a background. I would recommend putting on a nice shirt, uh, getting someone to take the photo for you and just step outside somewhere with like a neutral background uh, or a background that's not too busy. It could be like a wall. It could be like, you know, in this case, like some, um, some shrubbery or trees um, so that it allows you, you in your face your like who you are to stand out to pop um, going back um, like you can see with these headshots here like this one is a photo that someone took of me at one of the symposia that I run at City Tech a few years ago This one uh, I had my wife take in our neighborhood uh, with, you know, I used one of my lenses on our digital SLR so I'd have a nice bokeh effect, have a very blurry background uh, so that I would stand out from uh, the background. Um, though I'm not wearing a nice shirt, it was cold that day. But you, you wear like, you know, just a dress shirt or a nice blouse. Um, something you would consider like work attire, right? Um, here's an older photo uh, that I took in our backyard um, when we lived in Atlanta. Here I got my suit on and just like, you know, standing in front of some um, bushes in our backyard. Uh, again, trying to let my face and me pop from that background. Now, this is something really important here. Each profile is going to have a, its own unique URL uh, for your profile. Like in this case, www.linkedin.com slash im slash David Shaw. And whatever yours is, you can copy that and add that to the header of your resume. And so again, that gives someone who's looking at your resume an opportunity if they want to follow or click on that URL and visit your linkedin.com profile because your linkedin.com profile can have like basically everything that you put into that uh, job, that personal job search database document, you know, where you put in everything about your education, the classes you've taken, um, all your work experience, all your responsibilities there, all your volunteer work, all your accolades and honors uh, and cool stuff that you've done. Everything in that can go on the LinkedIn.com profile. And so this can be bigger, you know, longer, than that just one page resume that you have. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that you have to put everything from your personal job search database document into your LinkedIn.com profile uh, right now, but the more information that you put in, the better it is because everything you put in essentially becomes a keyword that could bring you up into a search that someone makes for uh, fulfilling a position at a, at a given job. Now, an important thing you do need to fill out is this summary. And this is kind of like a huge, like objective statement. So like at the top of the resume, you know, you're writing that one sentence objective. Whereas in the summary here, you're basically writing a short bio about yourself. And, and I would want you to write this so it's not too long, maybe, 50 words to 100 words maximum 50 words to 100 words but it should as it says here describe what motivates you what you're skilled at and what's next like what it is like you're building up to like what are your career aspirations um but you're thinking about like you know what drives you to be in like say the computer field or what drives you to be a technical writer you want to address that in you know just a sentence or two a few sentences in your summary, something that somebody can read just at a glance. It doesn't need to be very long. Then there's a section for filling out experience. And these are like where you've worked before. And it includes um, what kind of job it was, your job title, where it was, like what is the firm, the firm's name, the dates you worked there, start and finish, and where it was located at. And then you get to write like a sentence or two about like what you did there. Um, and you might even include a link under 
your that experience like to something you did there like if you made a document or created a website or something else you can link to it because again linkedin.com is all about links it's all about connections it's about showing off what you can do now you might not have that yet and that's fine okay i don't want you to think like oh god professor ellis wants me to like do all this stuff uh on my linkedin.com profile no i want you to fill in the basics like you know, you got that profile picture at the top with your name you're going to be filling out your summary you're going to be putting in basic experience stuff the work experience you might have had internship experience you might have had and if you don't have that yet just don't fill it out that's fine um, if you've done any kind of volunteer work or um, you community work or uh, you've been a part of an organization like Boy Scouts Girl Scouts Explorers you can include that under organizations uh, again, this shows you as a more well-rounded individual. It shows you uh, like all the different aspects of who you are and the kinds of things that you not only enjoy doing, but they reflect some of the experiences that you've had, uh, positive experiences that reflect positively on you. There's going to be a section you need to fill out for education. Um, and here you want to focus on higher education unless, as I've mentioned before, if you went to like say a magnet school or a special program type school that connects um, to the work that, that you plan to do, you may or may not want to include that here. Um, but I think for most folks in the class, it should be perfectly fine to go ahead and include all your education stuff here, high school, college. If you've transferred, you can include that. If you, if you took like some major classes at another college before transferring to City Tech, because within each of the education uh, experiences that you list here, you're going to, a little bit further down, be able to list courses. And again, the courses you list uh, are ways of you know, getting your name to come up in searches because these correspond, these courses you've taken correspond to your knowledge, the experience you have, the skills you have. So put in all your education experience here. Um, volunteer experiences and causes, you can include those. Skills and expertise. This is one of the coolest things I think about LinkedIn.com is that you can include keywords for the different kinds of skills you have or attributes, characteristics about yourself you want to include. And as you build connections to other people on LinkedIn.com, LinkedIn.com will occasionally ask those you're connected to can you verify or can you endorse um, you for these things that you know how to do? And those that can will like click yes, 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 no for all those different things. And you can see these numbers correspond to all the different people you know that can, that can attest to you having those skills. Honors and awards, again, all this stuff is just mirroring things that we've already talked about for your resume and the things that you should have put into your personal job application database. Copy and paste these, those things into your LinkedIn.com profile to make it as well-rounded as possible, as full of information about you as possible. Now, what's cool for those of you that may not have a lot of work experience, but you can obviously also do this for work experience as well, is projects. You can add projects to your profile um, and they can be things that you did like a, for like a team assignment or like a big project in a class, something you did on an internship. It's a way of being able to give some more details, the kind of details that you might put into your job application letter, right? You can copy and paste some of those things from some of that other writing into LinkedIn.com uh, to fill out details. So the writing that you've done in one place for like say a cover letter, you can copy and paste into these other places where it's relevant uh, to give those details where they're needed. Um, and then recommendations. This is something I'm, you, I'm not requiring you to have for the assignment, but it's something that you need to obtain in the future. Your recommendations are where you reach out to people uh, that are also on LinkedIn.com, like say professors in, in your other major classes, uh, and you ask them to give a recommendation, just like writing a recommendation letter. 
And these are public facing recommendations. These are things that anybody that has a LinkedIn.com account and finds you um, through like you know, a, a job search or something, they'll be able to read this and see some of the nice things that someone has said about you. And again, this is evidence to prove that you know what you know how to do, that you have the skills and the experience that you claim to have. So this is something that you want to aim to add to your LinkedIn.com profile in the future. Uh, but again, what we're aiming for right now is filling out these basics with anything that you can on your LinkedIn.com profile. Now, this brings us to what we're going to be working on uh, for this week. And I'll type up these in more detail, but obviously you'll be listening to the lecture now uh, and you should be making notes on these things. Um, to supplement what I put on our OpenLab.com site, course site. So for the weekly writing assignment, I want you to go back to LinkedIn uh, Learning through the New York Public Library website. And the objective is to go there, and I want you to search, and I'm going to show you how to do this in a second, I want you to search for Learning LinkedIn for students. You're going to search for learning LinkedIn for students. Now, let's see, where did Chrome go? All right. So here I've already logged into LinkedIn Learning with my library card from the New York Public Library. And from here, what we want to do is use the search box at the top. And what I'm going to do is just type in uh, learning LinkedIn for students. And I want to click on this very first one. And you're going to see this course, Learning Lin LinkedIn for Students, LinkedIn Learning by Oliver uh, Shington, March 2021. This is the one we want to click on. But before we do that, you can see here it's an hour and 38 minutes long. Now this course gives you all the basics and goes over all the steps of creating a profile and then populating it with your experience information uh, on LinkedIn.com using your personal um, job application database file that you've created and you've saved someplace safe. Remember, I'm not ever going to be looking in that. That's for your benefit to help you through all these other um, documents you're creating for this project and to make it a living document that helps you over time in your job searches in the future. Now, in a perfect world, you would watch this whole one hour, 38 minute course. Um, I understand this is not a perfect world. You may not have the time to do that. Already our lecture right now is looking at an hour and 37 minutes. But what I would want you to do, that if you don't have all the time in the world, I want you to use the remainder of this week's three hour lecture. You know, this is a three hour cl credit class, right? We're not meeting together for that long inside of a classroom. Uh, my lecture is not going to be that long because I allow for time, some work that you do uh, to figure into that or whether you come to office hours or write me an email, all that figures into that time. But I want you to use some of that time to watch as much of this course as you can. Now, what's great about it is you don't necessarily have to watch the whole thing start to finish. You can see here, I've already opened it, you can click on different sections of the course and watch just that part and it shows you how long that part of the course is. Why use LinkedIn? Well, it's two minutes and 36 seconds long. Uh, how to set up a new LinkedIn account? Well, that's probably important for those of you that don't have a LinkedIn.com account yet. That's four minutes and seven seconds long. I would watch that probably above anything else. Um, but watch as much of this as you can. And if you can watch the whole thing, that's for your benefit. That's going to help you out, okay? That's what this is all coming down to. All of this work that we're doing on this this isn't busy work. This is to prepare you to enter into the workplace and get the jobs that you're 
that obviously you want because you're getting this education. So get as much out of this as you can in order to be successful. And as I've said in the very first lecture, you know, this is a three credit hour class. And there's an unwritten expectation that for every hour you're spending in class, you should spend two outside of class on homework. So for a three credit class, you should be investing six hours of your time in doing readings, viewings like this, uh, and doing the homework in the class. If you're trying to skate by with investing as little time and energy as possible, well, I mean, you're going to get out of it what you put in. And you might not get back as much as you expect because you're not investing that time. Now, I totally understand that you got a lot of other responsibilities between school, your other classes, life, work, etc. But again, as I started this, this lecture with, it comes down to priorities. Please prioritize those things that are going to help make you successful in life, to give you the life that you want and the type of work that you want that makes that life possible. Um, so again, try to do to view as much of these um, these course lectures as possible to get as much out of how to build that LinkedIn.com profile. Now that's going to help you create your LinkedIn.com profile, but where this comes into our weekly writing assignment is I want you to watch as much of that learning LinkedIn for students course as possible, and then write a memo of at least 250 words in which you highlight some of the main things that you learn from watching those videos. Um, what are some of the reasons about uh, why you would create a LinkedIn.com profile? No, don't just listen to me. See what they have to say on those videos. Um, what points do they raise about how to create your profile, how to make a good and persuasive profile? Anything that you think is important you'll want to include in that 250 word minimum memo. And basically write that memo someplace safe in Microsoft Word, Google Docs, Apple Pages, doesn't matter, LibreOffice if you're like me. Then copy and paste it into a comment on the week four weekly writing assignment and then click post comment. And then that'll give you your credit for this week's weekly writing assignment. So you're getting some writing practice you're learning more about LinkedIn by watching this lecture on LinkedIn Learning's website, which you get available for free through the New York Public Library and your library card. Um, but it's also helping you fulfill the requirements of the main project we're working on, which is your job application portfolio. I hope you're beginning to see, now that we're in week four, that I'm trying to build everything together so that everything dovetails together. They all work together, that nothing's busy work. Everything is, in, is intended to help move you along, progress you toward not only completing the assignments, but getting as much out of these assignments as possible so that you can carry that knowledge and that experience forward once you leave our, my class. Now, second thing is your homework. The homework is you need to create a job application letter, draft a job application letter, and you need to look back at your research that you did of the different job ads that you found on monster.com you know, all those weeks back. Um, or you may go back into monster.com and look for a new job. That's totally fine as well. Doesn't matter to me. I want it to be a job that you would be something that you would want to apply for. It may be something that you're not fully qualified for yet. That's fine. Um, and again, you can use some of those strategies I talked about before where you try to either account for like not having a or meeting a requirement or how something else you've done should satisfy whatever requirement you don't meet in the job ad. But try to find one of those job ads that actually gives you a name of a person that is your point of contact. So that when you write the letter, and bring up that sample letter again, you'll have somebody's name and an address that you can actually mention in your letter. Uh, so that name, what their title is, and what is the address of their company. Now the job ad might not include like the full address, in which case just go to Google, find it that way. Um, TechCrunch.com is also a good resource for finding job, I mean, um, company addresses. 
Um, but yeah, look for an ad that where you got a point of contact and you have like you know, the name of the company and an address to include. So you're writing a full professional business type letter for your job application letter. I'll give you a link again to the sample so you have the sample to work from and there are other samples in the Paul Anderson um, chapter 2 we looked at earlier this semester. Okay, computer just crashed so hopefully we didn't lose too much of this week's lecture. Uh, again, there's another reason why I say make sure you're always saving your work. Uh, you don't want uh, the computer to eat your homework, right? So uh, just to wrap things up, this week's weekly writing assignment I'll post to our Open Lab site. Um, you will go to LinkedIn Learning via the New York Public Library using your library card and PIN number. You will search for Learning LinkedIn for students. Watch that course as much as you can. Please watch as much as you can and then write a memo that's at least 250 words long. It's like one page double spaced. Okay, not a lot of writing but it's good regular writing practice and it's allowing you to to pick up some things from um, LinkedIn learning about how to create a good LinkedIn.com profile and why it's a good idea to create a LinkedIn.com profile. Listen to what they have to say and then summarize some of those highlights in your memo in your own words and then you'll copy and paste that from wherever you wrote it into a comment to the week four weekly writing assignment post. Then for your homework, you will want to write your job application letter for the project and create your LinkedIn.com profile. Um, you've got a model for what the letter should look like. Um, you can find the address and a point of contact in the job ad. If the job ad you're looking at doesn't have that, well look at some of the others, see if they do, because again this is just practice. Uh, I don't want to make this too onerous. I'm not saying you gotta go out and call all these companies and find out who you need to be writing this to. Um, so look for an ad that gives you that information. So you just have it and then you can plug it into your, the professional business style letter that you're writing. Uh, and then of course create a LinkedIn.com profile. Populate it with that information from your personal um, job search database. And again, um, you don't have to have everything in there. You don't have to have the references yet. Um, that, can, that will come in, in time. But um, create as much as you can of your profile Put a headshot on there. Again, an outdoor photo is probably best. And again, it just needs to be, it should be a photo just like what you see of me here. Uh, maybe a little closer so you can see the face a little bit better, right? Um, and it should be professional. Wear like a good shirt or blouse, um, something you'd wear in the workplace. Uh, and hold on to those. This homework I'm not collecting yet because again, next week, I will talk to you about doing peer review on these documents and we're gonna involve everybody in the class because we have a small class um, and so we can work together to get feedback uh, on the documents that you've created as well as give feedback. And that giving feedback is actually really super beneficial for you all because you get to see how other people have made their documents which you can learn from uh, and by critiquing others and the things that they've done it actually gives you a better eye about you know, how to make the, your own documents uh, and how to make them as strong as possible. So peer review isn't just about always giving something. You're getting something back, not only in the feedback, but you're learning something through that process of doing peer review. So I'll, I'll tell you all about that next week. Don't worry about that right now. All you need to do is make sure that for next week, you do the weekly writing assignment for week four, that you write your job application letter draft, you create your LinkedIn.com profile and you still have those two resumes that you created uh, this past week. And we're going to use those two resumes, the job application letter and your LinkedIn.com profile for peer review next week, okay? So everybody, you know, take care of yourselves, take care of everybody around you. Um, good luck in your other classes. Um, if you haven't got vaccinated yet, please do so. Uh, take care of that, you gotta take care of that. Uh, mask up and you avoid any situation where you could run the risk of um, catching the virus because 
you know, one of the things to keep in mind is it's not just about whether you get sick or not, whether you go to the hospital or not, um, but also like whether you pass this on to someone else who may you know, not have like as good an immune system that may send them to the hospital or even worse end up dead. Um, I just actually just to let you guys know I heard from one of my friends back in Atlanta uh, two brothers I used to know there they, they moved out of Atlanta down to Florida I don't know whether they were vaccinated or not but they the both brothers actually got in the hospital with COVID and one of them died and this is just like a few days ago um, so I mean I'm sure you know that this stuff is like real and, and deadly and dangerous um, but we got to protect ourselves as well as those that are around us. Got to take care of other people. Um, so hang in there. We're going to get through this. We're going like, to you know, do everything we can to make this class. Um, you know, fulfill those things that you told me you wanted to get out of the class. But also the things that I want to get out of it, which is to help you be successful uh, professionally and in life once you're out of the class. Um, because once you, you go off and you get a big job, uh, you can come back and see me and, and tell me all the great stuff you're up to because I want to know. Uh, I want to be proud of you all and I want to you know, send you on to do really great things in the world. Um, so remember, uh, if you got questions or anything, that uh, office hours are on Wednesday, 3 to 5, or uh, send me an email with your availability for like the next seven days and I'll find a time where we both can meet. Or you can also email me, jls at citytech.cuny.edu. Um, I'll get back to you right away as soon as I can when I get that email from you. So everybody take care, and I will talk to you all again next week.